The unfortunate condition of the persons whose labor in part I employed has been the only unavoidable subject of regret. To make the adults among them as easy and as comfortable in their circumstances as their actual state of ignorance and improvidence would admit, and to lay a foundation to prepare the rising generation for a destiny different from that in which they were born, afforded some satisfaction to my mind, and could not, I hoped, be displeasing to the justice of the Creator. Though he didn't use the word, and indeed it was one avoided on a number of occasions, such as the drafting of the U.S. Constitution, Washington in this quote was talking about his slaves. This is not a direct quote from Washington, however. Rather, it's one recounted by his friend and future biographer David Humphreys of a conversation the two had in late 1788 or early 1789. Humphreys wrote this statement in the midst of a notebook in which he was also making notes of statements for Washington to deliver publicly prior to his assuming the presidency, and was examined closely by historian Henry Winsett in his 2003 book on Washington and slavery. Considering it along with other Washington writings, Winsett ultimately came to the conclusion that the first president was considering emancipating his slaves ten years prior to his writing that clause into his will. However, consideration and lofty words were one thing. Action was another. And as he supposedly spoke these words to Humphreys, and for a decade more, slaves would work the fields at Mount Vernon. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. As this is such a crucial subject to cover and comprehend, I didn't want it to be a part of another episode on the Washington administration. Now that we're a good pace along in our journey, it's time to give the subject of slavery in America the attention it deserves. Growing up in Louisiana, I not only saw the big plantation homes in person, but also witnessed the legacy that this cruel and barbaric system has left. For all the stories of courage and perseverance of people like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, there are so many more of people crushed and deprived of the very principles of liberty and justice that our founding fathers professed to hold most dear. At times, with these cruelties being inflicted on enslaved persons by those very same founding fathers. This is a legacy that our nation is still trying to come to terms with, along with addressing and combating modern forms of slavery. There are still many steps ahead to make the ideals of freedom and justice a reality for all. But part of what will help us get there, in my humble opinion, is an understanding of where we've been and how that impacts where we're at. With that said... Let's get started. The first enslaved peoples of African descent were landed at the English colony of Virginia in 1619, but these were not the first enslaved people to be brought from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. That dubious honor goes to the Spanish, who had sent slaves over as early as 1510 to work gold mines in Hispaniola. In terms of what became the eastern seaboard of the United States, the Spanish established a colony in 1526 near Sapelo Sound in what is now Georgia, where an unknown number of enslaved persons of African descent were brought from Hispaniola. The colony was ultimately a failure, with its leader dying of disease, and the Africans rebelling and seemingly joining the local Guale native peoples after the Spanish colonists fled back to the Caribbean. Not only were individuals of African descent forced into slavery, but the Spanish government would authorize the enslavement of certain native peoples in the Americas beginning in 1503 and continuing on through the 17th century with Spanish slaving ventures even taking place in what is now the Carolinas. Indeed, the first native peoples enslaved by Europeans would be enslaved at the order of Christopher Columbus himself in the late 1490s. British colonists would pick up the practice and the enslavement of Indians would be prominent for a time in the colonies of the southeast. In the earliest days of the colony of Georgia, the enslavement of people of African descent was actually forbidden, and the only slaves that colonists could own were Native Americans. However, the colonists in Georgia enslaved relatively few Native peoples, and instead snuck enslaved blacks across the border from South Carolina until finally the trustees of the colony agreed to abandon the slavery provision statute in an attempt to boost the colony's economy. South Carolina would become the leader in the Indian slave trade in the British North American colonies, though it ultimately petered out due to, quote, the declining supply, problems with the captives, and proprietary opposition. The focus soon became on the slave trade from Africa. 
The first ship carrying enslaved peoples of African descent made its way to New England in 1638 and spread through the other colonies being established on the eastern seaboard from there. Around 1660, various colonies, including Maryland and Virginia, started writing statutes into their laws governing slavery. Slowly but surely, the practice was becoming an institution in the British colonies. We don't necessarily have time to talk about the differences in and development of slavery in each of the colonies, though if you are interested, there's a wealth of information out there. But suffice it to say, the institution grew to encompass more enslaved peoples in the southern colonies rather than those in the north, as the New England colonies did not have a staple crop which, quote, demanded regiments of raw labor, while the southern colonies did have the agricultural and economic incentive from the tobacco trade to make slavery become, quote, a vitally important institution in colonial operations. Though it should be noted that, even in southern colonies such as Virginia, it took a while for the enslaved population to grow to a sizable portion. Just over 50 years after the first enslaved Africans were disembarked at Jamestown, the enslaved population in Virginia was estimated at 2,000 out of a total colony population of 40,000. There was, however, a need seen to legally define the institution and the difference between free and slave. Though it does appear from historical evidence that we have available that even early on, servants of African descent were treated differently than white servants. Legally at first, they were the same. Both were considered indentured servants by the law. In practice, however, the terms of servitude for black servants was typically lacking an end date, thus making them de facto slaves. Naturally, these people serving for life fetched a higher price than indentured servants with a limited term of service, as noted by Winthrop Jordan in his examination of slavery in America prior to 1700. So out of economic necessity and growing social norms, the legal codification of slavery began in earnest after 1640. The process in Virginia started with distinguishing between slaves and indentured servants, and little by little, laws were put into place working up to the Virginia General Assembly in 1660, officially legalizing the enslavement for life, not only of individuals of African descent, but of children born to an enslaved mother. This is not to say that the codification of difference between those of European descent and those of African descent did not occur in the North. The Massachusetts colonial legislature had legalized the enslavement of people of African descent in 1641, while the Connecticut legislature followed suit in 1650. As early as the late 1650s and early 1660s, both Massachusetts and Connecticut passed laws excluding people of color, even free people of color, from militia service. Up and down the seaboard, the legal distinction between free and slave and between black and white was being developed and taking root. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. One area in which slavery was different on the eastern seaboard than it was in colonies in the Caribbean and South America was that a great part of the increase of the slave population came from natural increase rather than the importation of new slaves. While new enslaved peoples would be introduced, by 1750, nearly 80% of the enslaved peoples in Virginia had been born in that colony. Overall, it is estimated that 389,000 enslaved people were transported from Africa to what is now the United States while an estimated 10.7 million enslaved people overall were transported from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. Slaves in the West Indies and South America were worked to death while a slave breeding industry developed in what would become the East Coast of the United States. In Virginia alone, the slave population increased from 13,000 in 1700 to 105,000 by 1750. Though some white colonists during this time began to grow concerned about this large increase in the slave population, with wealthy planner William Byrd II writing in 1736 that, quote, I am sensible of many bad consequences of multiplying these Ethiopians amongst us. By 1757, a minister in Virginia would write that, quote, to live in Virginia without slaves is morally impossible. The commentary by both men centers around the idea that having the enslaved labor at their beck and call made it both economically and socially impossible to hire white labor for certain tasks. 
Not only was it far cheaper and thus more profitable to buy slaves to do certain labor, as Byrd noted, quote, White people, seeing a rank of poor creatures below them, detest work for fear it should make them look like slaves. The system of indentured servitude in Virginia had all but vanished by the end of the 17th century as it could not compete with the slave system. Everyone was becoming trapped, whether by their own volition or by the imposed will of others, in an ultimately unsustainable system. As noted by historian Anthony S. Parent, quote, During a brief period in the late 17th and early 18th century, a small but powerful planter class, acting in their short-term interest, gave America its racial dilemma. Ned and Constance Sublette came out with a well-researched tome last year, 2016 for any folks listening in the future, entitled The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry, which goes into much more detail than I'll be able to in this episode. However, I'd like to spend a few minutes considering how conditions were for enslaved people in colonial and early America before bringing us up to 1792 and back to Washington. In the north, slaves were to be found in areas with a wealthy elite, with descriptions coming down to us of wealthy Boston merchants and their families being transported about town in a horse-drawn chase driven by an enslaved black person. Newly arrived enslaved persons would be disembarked at the wharfs and sold at the London Coffee House and other public places in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Though not in as great of numbers, and there was a greater possibility of individuals being able to buy their freedom, Enslaved persons still populated the colonies of the North as they moved towards independence. Meanwhile, field work on a southern plantation was described by one visitor as follows. Quote, he, the slave, is called up in the morning at daybreak and is seldom allowed time enough to swallow three mouthfuls of hominy or hoe cake, but is driven out immediately to the field to hard labor, at which he continues without intermission until noon. And it is observed as a singular circumstance that they always carry out a piece of fire with them and kindle one just by their work, let the weather be ever so hot and sultry. About noon is the time he eats his dinner, and he is seldom allowed an hour for that purpose. His meal consists of hominy and salt, and, if his master be a man of humanity, he has a little fat, skim milk, rusty bacon, or salt herring to relish his hominy or hoe cake twice a week. Then they return to severe labor, which continues in the field until dusk. It is late at night, if there is work to be done in the tobacco houses, before he returns to his second scanty meal. Day after day, year after year, field hands were worked until they couldn't work any more. Then they were replaced. That was their life. However, even more valuable than a male field hand was a female slave. As more of the wealth of the South became measured in its enslaved workforce, a fertile female slave became even more valuable as she would allow her owner an opportunity to grow the workforce, and thus the owner's wealth, naturally. As noted by Thomas Jefferson, quote, A woman who brings a child every two years is more profitable than the best man of the farm. Female slaves had another value to their masters as well as was written in the 19th century by Harriet Jacobs in her memoir after she had escaped from slavery. Quote, Slavery is terrible for men, but is far more terrible for women. Slaveholders have been cunning enough to enact that the child shall follow the condition of the mother, not of the father, thus taking care that licentiousness shall not interfere with avarice. It is no secret, nor it seems was it uncommon, that masters would take advantage of their power and rape their slaves. I would like to note that I use the word rape here very deliberately. As Jacobs wrote of her experience, quote, The slave girl is reared in an atmosphere of licentiousness and fear. The lash and the foul talk of her master and his sons are her teachers. When she is 14 or 15, the owner or his sons or the overseer or perhaps all of them begin to bribe her with presents. If these fail to accomplish their purpose, she is whipped or starved into submission to their will. Resistance is hopeless. Any offspring that would result from this personal violation would then be subject to the whim of their father as to whether they would be enslaved or freed. Indeed, Martha Washington would be witness to this when she married into the family of her first husband, Daniel Custis. Around 1739, Daniel's father, John Custis, revealed to his son that he had fathered a son with one of his slaves. This son, who would come to be known as Black Jack, would not only be invited into the family, 
but John Custis would petition the governor of Virginia and the Colonial Council to set the child free. This was reaffirmed in Custis's will, where he provisioned for Daniel to build his half-brother, quote, a handsome, strong, convenient dwelling house, as well as provide him with, quote, a good riding horse and two able working horses, along with a yearly provision of food, clothes, and additional livestock, in addition to his directly willing to jack land, livestock, and a lifetime annuity. Jack would die only a couple of years after his father, around the age of 12, which, as noted by historian Henry Winsack, quote, rescued Martha and Daniel from the humiliating requirement of overseeing the welfare of a freed slave who had been granted a life of ease on their money, as Winsett conjectures they thought of the matter. This was not always the case, however, and some masters would retain their own children in slavery, and even in the case of the Custises, Jack may have been freed, but his mother was not. As John Adams would write later in his life in a private letter about his friend Jefferson's rumored and, as modern historians have concluded, quite probable rape of his slave, Sally Hemings, quote, The story of the latter, Sally Hemings, is a natural and almost unavoidable consequence of that foul contagion in the human character, Negro slavery. Naturally, some folks would seek freedom from this oppressive system by running away. As noted by Kay and Carey in their study of slavery in North Carolina prior to the Revolution, quote, Variations in geography, demography, and the social and psychological makeup of individual slave populations affected specific runaway patterns. The Great Dismal Swamp on the eastern border of Virginia and North Carolina and Spanish Florida made attractive sanctuaries for those able to escape there, though some fled west to the Appalachian Mountains to take their chances with, quote, the unpredictable, often hostile Cherokee. As is well known, not all those who attempted escape from enslavement succeeded, and some would even voluntarily return due to a lack of provisions or after negotiating terms with their master or his or her agents. Others would seek their freedom not by running away, but by physical force. 1739 would see a group of around 20 enslaved blacks attack a store at Stono, South Carolina in the morning, killing the storekeeper and taking arms and gunpowder before going through the countryside seeking recruits. Their force would grow to somewhere around 60 and 100 strong, but they would be quickly shut down once a force of white militiamen assembled and confronted them. The Stono Rebellion, as it would come to be called, quote, was the largest slave revolt to occur anywhere on the mainland during the colonial period and would inspire fear in white slave owners of the potential price for their personal profits made through the forced labor of others. This fear would increasingly come to play a role in public policy, such as in the case when, while in the midst of the French and Indian War, the Virginia House of Burgesses allocated more funds in its, quote, military appropriations to the militia, which bore the responsibility for internal security and control of the slaves, than it would to the Virginia Regiment, which was charged with defending the frontier from attacks by French and Native American forces. By 1776, enslaved black individuals made up around a fifth to a sixth of the population of what would become the United States, and the American Revolution would impact that population as it did the colonists as a whole. Even before the Revolution, certain individuals and groups in the colonies were beginning to express their opposition to the institution of slavery. James Otis of Massachusetts published a work entitled Rights of the British Colonies in 1764, in which he asserted that, quote, the colonists are by the law of nature freeborn, as indeed all men are, white or black. Does it follow that tis right to enslave a man because he is black? Nearly a decade later, Benjamin Rush published an anti-slavery tract in Philadelphia in 1773, in which he posed the following questions, quote, If you possessed an estate which was bequeathed to you by your ancestors and were afterwards convinced that it was the just property of another man, would you think it right to continue in the possession of it? The voice of all mankind would make him for a villain who would refuse to comply with this demand of justice. And is not keeping a slave after you are convinced of the unlawfulness of it a crime of the same nature? All the money you save or acquire by their labor is stolen from them. And however plausible the excuse may be that you form to reconcile it to your consciousness, yet be assured that your crime stands registered in the court of heaven. 
Organized opposition to the practice began to develop amongst religious groups such as the Quakers and the Methodists. When Vermont constituted itself in 1777, it abolished slavery in its constitution, the first former British colony to do so. It was soon followed by three northern states, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, which approved a gradual abolition of slavery in their borders, while two others, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, had state courts ruling that slavery was unconstitutional by their respective state constitutions. Even in southern colonies turned states, the revolution would prompt in some sectors of the population a rethink of the slave system. Though the movement was small, two abolition societies would be formed in Wilmington, Delaware in 1788, and even if they did not join such societies, the slave owners of Delaware increasingly voluntarily freed their slaves. Virginia became the first government in the Western Hemisphere to ban the slave trade in 1778, and the State House of Delegates approved legislation in 1782 which made it legal for slave owners to free their slaves, with thousands of slaves shortly after being freed by small and middle-class slave owners before taking a further step in 1785 with legislation which freed all slaves brought into Virginia after one year in the state. All states, except for Georgia and South Carolina, had adopted legislation to end the slave trade by the end of the Revolution. Why, then, didn't slavery wither on the vine, as a number of contemporaries felt it would? Ultimately, Gary B. Nash, in his study of slavery and the founding generation, asserts that the problem stemmed from the inability of those who supported abolition to properly address and agree upon a plan to solve two key issues. Quote, how would slave owners be compensated, and how would freed slaves be fit into the social fabric of the new nation? Nash attributes the failure to both northern and southern leaders who, quote, lost the abolitionist fire in their bellies on both of these cardinal points. Henry Winsett points to the Constitutional Convention as a pivotal point of failure to address the issue. Washington wrote two years before the convention that, quote, I confess to you candidly that I can foresee no evil greater than disunion. And the delegates to that convention ultimately chose to prioritize the cause of union over the cause of abolitionism, by supporting the Three-Fifths Compromise, by declining to end the slave trade on a national scale for a period of at least 20 years, by inserting the Fugitive Slave Clause, allowing slave owners to seek runaway slaves even into free states, and by assuring states of federal aid in the event of a slave rebellion. However, Washington's fellow Virginian, George Mason, pointed out that by not seeking an immediate end to slavery and instead kicking the can down the road, the founding generation was ensuring the continuation of slavery as the American victory in the Revolution had opened up lands to the West where settlers were, quote, already calling out for slaves for their now lands and will fill that country with slaves. Mason warned that slavery, quote, brings the judgment of heaven on a country. As nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, Providence punishes national sins by national calamities. This brings us back to Washington, who watched silent over the proceedings of the Constitutional Convention as president of the convention. Even if he had been able to speak, it is questionable as to whether Washington would have pushed for anything different. As he said in a letter to Lafayette in May 1786, quote, It is one of the evils of democratical governments that the people, not always seen and frequently misled, must often feel before they can act right. But then evils of this nature seldom fail to work their own cure. It is to be lamented, nevertheless, that the remedies are so slow, and that those who may wish to apply them seasonably are not attended to before they suffer in person, in interest, and in reputation. Washington was being pushed by multiple people, including his wartime friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, to agree to provide an example to other slave owners by voluntarily freeing his slaves, with some making the argument that his, quote, reputation would be forever tarnished if he did not do so. However, Washington declined to go that far. He wrote to Robert Morris in 1786 that, quote, I can only say that there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of it, slavery. But there is only one proper and effectual mode by which it can be accomplished, and that is by legislative authority. And this, as far as my suffrage will go, shall never be wanting. He was willing to go as far as abolition, but not alone and not without a good plan. 
As noted by historian Philip Morgan, quote, Increasingly, then, Washington was trapped in a network of mutual dependency from which it was difficult to extricate himself. By the mid-1780s, he and his slaves were enmeshed in a tangled web. Morgan also makes the point that, quote, For Washington, any manumission he might devise necessarily had political ramifications. Ever the realist, Washington was fully aware of slavery's potential to divide. Presiding over the Constitutional Convention must have impressed him with the sheer explosiveness of the issue. For Washington, as for many others, the subject engendered such raw emotions that public comments were best left unsaid. Thus, the Washingtons traveled to New York City for George to assume the presidency with a retinue of slaves to serve their household. Included in this initial group of seven slaves were, quote, two personal slaves from Martha, Molly or Maul, and a 16-year-old mulatto girl named Ona, or Oni Judge, who had become her, Martha's, favorite, as well as Austin and Christopher Shields, who would act as waiters, while Giles and Paris, who had accompanied Washington to the Constitutional Convention, would reprise their roles as coachmen. Washington's personal manservant, Billy Lee, would also be brought up to the presidential mansion despite suffering from fractures to his knees. Both Washington and his personal secretary, Tobias Lear, had attempted to talk Lee out of making the journey. But by all accounts, Lee was determined that he would continue to serve Washington as he had for many years prior. Both the black enslaved and white hired servants would wear the same uniforms. Quote, a white livery with red trim on the cuffs and collars and would serve the Washingtons and their guests at the two homes that served as the executive mansions while in New York. The move of the capital of Philadelphia, however, would cause a problem for Washington, as state law asserted that any adult slave resident in the state for six consecutive months was free. As three of his slaves, including Ona Judge and Christopher Shields, were minors at the time, they were exempt from this provision. But for the rest, Washington would have to devise a reason to send each of them back to Mount Vernon for a brief stay before returning in order to reset the clock, as the law specifically stated that they had to reside in Pennsylvania for six consecutive months. As he had not allowed the wives of the male slaves to join them in Philadelphia, that provided a plausible excuse for some, as he pledged to allow them to return home to see their wives. But Washington and Lear would have to be cautious and observant to see if any of the enslaved peoples in the official household discovered the real reason for their trips back to Mount Vernon. If any of them escaped, it could prove politically embarrassing for Washington to attempt to recapture them. For someone who professed to want nothing more than the abolition of slavery, it seems that, as 1792 approached, Washington was willing to work hard to ensure the continued enslavement of these individuals in his household. And, as events will show, he was willing to go a bit further, if necessary. But that is the story for on down the line. For the time being, I think this provides a good stopping point for us. Next time, we'll proceed on with the narrative into 1792 and discuss the election of that year as well as the implications that election would have for Washington's second term. There was little doubt in anyone's mind that Washington would serve a second term, except, of course, in the mind of Washington himself, as we'll see in our next episode, which I'm calling, Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? The Election of 1792. Before we close, I'd like to give special thanks to the podcast audio editor, Andrew Foncook. Andrew has been working with me on my other podcast, The Harrison Podcast, for a few months now, so I felt it was time, as I'm looking at where I'm going in my second year of podcasting, to pull him onto this podcast and put his audio editing talents to good use. If you are in need of assistance with your next audio project, Andrew's email address is andrew at foncook, that's P-F-A-N-N-K-U-C-H-E dot com. He's a pleasure to work with and comes highly recommended. If you'd like to reach out to me with any questions, comments, or just to say hi, I'm available at Presidency's Podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash presidencies and on Twitter at presidencies89. Source information, and as you can imagine, in covering a span of 300 years in one episode, there are a number of sources used for this one, can be found at presidencies.blueberry. That's B-L-U-B-R-R-Y dot com. If you need to catch up, past episodes can also be accessed at the site, as well as on iTunes or Stitcher, if you're not listening from one of those platforms already. As always, take care, dear friends. <laughs>
until next time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.